Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm June. I'm the instructor for this workshop, uh, GATK Variant Calling. So welcome, everyone. Uh, so for now, does everyone mind turning on your camera? <laughs> Just so that I, I know who you are, you're, you're there. Hi. <laughs> Okay, so uh, before we start, like it seems like we have a very small um, uh, crowd, so that's that's good, I guess. Um, so uh, just a, like a little bit about myself. So I, I think at first we can maybe go around since just there's just a few of us. It's very easy to quickly go around and introduce ourselves quickly. Um, so um, my name is June. Uh, I am a postdoc in the EEB department at UCLA. Uh, I work with Kirk Lohmuller. Um, I'm a population geneticist and anthropological geneticist. Um, I got my degree in anthropology and now I study human population genetics stuff related to archaic humans and also modern human evolution. Um, so uh, do we want to quickly go around and tell me which institute or department you're from? Um, what is your favorite biological question like i'm not sure if everybody here is graduate student or some some of you may be like undergrad or faculty like i'm not sure so just tell us a little bit about yourself and also um i know not everybody fill out the the questionnaire on google form and that's okay so just in a few words just tell me what's your main goal of attending this workshop like like if you're trying to be a GATK expert, if you have your own data or you're trying to work on like right now, or you're just trying to get a brief understanding. So, so just, just like a little bit so that I know what to, what to get ready for. Um, does, do I have a volunteer that wants to start? Okay, I'll go first. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Omari and I'm from Cornell University and I'm studying biomedical engineering PhD. I'm currently in my second year and I'm very interested in the use of cell-free DNA uh, to study infectious diseases. Uh, but I'm very new uh, to this topic and to the field in general. So I figured it's a, it's a good skill to, to learn. Yeah, that, that sounds great. Um, um, I can go next. Sure. Yeah, hi, I'm Rohan. Uh, I have a background in bioinformatics. Mostly I worked with like RNA seq data. And uh, like while, so I was working at Wild Cornell and now I have moved to Case Western over here. So now I'm working with like uh, imaging data. So my primary interests are like uh, kind of like integrated sensors, like in imaging and uh, omics. And uh, I have always like wanted to work with like different kinds of omics data sets. So uh, I'm like always like uh, trying to learn like different omics like single cell RNA seq and like whole exome data sets and like different kinds of omics data sets. Although I'm kind of like familiar familiar with these technologies and like I've seen people working with like variants and things, but yeah, I haven't really like gone uh, like a deep dive and learn how to like process these things and like how, what do they mean? Basically SNPs and all these kind of things, so yeah. Yeah, that, that sounds great. And I think what you're good at is something I, I don't really know. Like I, I don't really work on RNC, but that, that sounds cool. Yeah, will be good. Uh, anyone else next? I can go next. Yeah. Guys, my name is Kim. I am also a second year PhD student like Omari. Um, I'm in the anthro and third department, sorry, a truck is coming by. It's okay. um, I'm in the anthropology department at UCLA and I study human genetics and epigenetics. And I've been kind of going down like a selection scan wormhole lately. Yep. But it, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. I, I saw that you work with Abby, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Say hi to her. I haven't seen her in a year. <laughs> oh yeah, that's so cool. I didn't know you guys knew each other. Yeah, we, we barely met right before the pandemic started. And, and like we said, well, let's get coffee at some, at some point. And then, then we never see each other again. <laughs> oh, yeah, she's super busy. She has like two kids. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's really cool, though. Cool. Um, can you hear me? Else? Yeah, I can hear you. So uh, I'm a postdoc at Cedars. Uh, my name is Sarona. I don't have my I have a camera in my lab. That's fine. Computer, so it's off. Uh, 
so i just i'm just taking this workshop to learn about uh, the variant calling and stuff yeah just out of interest yeah cool yeah um and we see we have a new person joining us uh hi mohammed are you there <laughs> Um, okay, yeah. Um, if you have, uh, do, do you have your camera on, or do you, uh, like, uh, or do you have your microphone? Like, I mean, if not, that's fine. Like, we're just quickly going around to introduce ourselves. That that's okay. Yeah, that, no worries. Um, yeah, and again, I'm I'm June. I'm teaching this workshop. So okay. Uh, so now that we briefly know each other. Before you type in, sorry, he does this. Okay, that, that, that's okay. So, so um, before we start, I just wanted to uh, like go over some quick like housekeeping stuff. Um, so uh, everything we're going to cover for the next two days are gonna be recorded. Um, so just to avoid some uh, interactive issues with, with Zoom, uh, I would like you to have yourself muted most of the time. Um, when I'm sharing my screen, I actually can't really see the chat box. Like I, I realize that. So if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me. Just unmute yourself at that time. Just say, I have a question, stop there. Like I'll, I'll stop there. Um, but it just like, if you type in the chat box while I'm sharing my screen, I can't really see that. I, I, I won't even, I think I won't even know there's, there's a, like a, there's a message. Um, so it's actually my first time teaching this workshop. So I have everything prepared. Um, what I don't know and I, I like uh, is like how much realistic I can cover in three hours. <laughs> so if I'm going very fast or too slow, uh, feel free to let me know. Um, and my plan is to have the backbone of GATK covered today and go over some of the details with like, like, like how to deal with the VCS and how to clean that tomorrow and maybe do more like question like Q and A things tomorrow. So that's that's a plan, but I may not exactly follow that depending on how, how things go. Like I realistically, I don't really know how long it takes to cover all my slides. So let's, let's try and start. <laughs> all right, so, oh, before we start, um, is everybody on uh, Hoffman right now? Okay. Uh, so uh, I will start with some lectures, but at some point, uh, I think it will be cool that we, so since just, there's just a few of us, like we each get on Hoffman and type some things, I can share my screen on my end and, and just to see if everything will go. Like we, we, we won't actually run real analysis during these three hours because some things will take more than three hours to finish, um, but at least we can cover the basic commands. So if you have your uh, terminal or or whatever command line open, like that would be very convenient. Um, so let's start. Okay, is everybody seeing my slide? Sounds good. Okay, we went over this already. Okay, so this is the schedule for the next um, two days. Um, so I will. Uh, Especially today, I will go with some um, lectures, especially for the first half of today. Um, and we'll talk about like the basics of what is a genomic variance, uh, what is variant calling and how GATK works also together with other programs, like, like in general, how, how this thing works. Um, and also during today and also during tomorrow, uh, we'll run some interactive practices uh, what I mean by that is we literally type in some code and see if GAT can respond to us um, and if it throws us errors or, or something like that. So during these practices after today and tomorrow, what I'm expecting to see is we should uh, set up a GATK pipeline on Hoffman uh, that will go from route sequence to a, a VCF for a few individuals. Um, so for the assignment for this workshop, I don't, I don't really want to throw you some very new, uh, like super big data set. Um, so if you have uh, downloaded this data set that I shared with you, um, that will be the data you can work on. Or if you have your own data, like so say right now you have some BAM files, you want to make VCFs based on that, you can work on that too. Um, so for the, like, I think for those of you for getting grades, um, 
other than the attendance, uh, you're going to be graded based on the assignment and also like a small quiz by the end of tomorrow. Um, so for the assignment, it's as simple as by the end of the day, we get a VCF output. And if so, if we can get that, everything looks good, we're happy. Um, so the assignment and also the quiz, both of them are not going to be due until literally the end of this week. So you have, uh, I know some of the, the analysis on GATK may take a few hours, and especially if you're running into errors, it may take some time to debug. So you, you guys all have the end of Sunday to, to show me that you have your output and you turn in the quiz. So the quiz will be another Google form that I will send out. Um, I will send it out after we finish everything by the end of tomorrow. And you, you can finish that in class or you can take it home and fill it up before, uh, before next week. All right. So, um, so let's start with some of the, the basics with uh, genomic variants. Um, so I think uh, from what I from what Eloy told me, uh, all of you guys have taken a NGS workshop before or something equivalent to that. So you should know a little bit about like how a, like a fastq file looks like and maybe even how bump file looks like. So we know that those files they cover this information for the entire uh, genome. So say if we're talking about humans, uh, which is the organism I'm most familiar with. Um, so most of the examples I'm going to give here are based on human. Um, if you need some examples with some other stuff, so I, can, I can probably talk about something about mice, but not really about plants. Anyway, so for humans, our genome is about like three gigabytes in size. So that, that's, that's a lot of information. So if we're talking about like sequences, like if you're looking at our FASTQ files or, or the BOM files for humans, that's a lot. And if we have several individuals, um, we're talking about a lot of like disk storage. Uh, realistically, when we study, a, say, a population, um, what we're interested in most of the time is not like what exactly are these three gig base pairs, like what, what they are in, in sequence and what genes they code. Most of the time, what we're interested in is the difference between individuals or between populations. Because we know that most of our genomes are very conservative. Uh, it is not just a conservative between human individuals, it's also a lot of them are almost identical shared across species. So some um, um, like fun fact about like how conservative our genomes could be, we know that among humans, 99.9% .9 of genomes are identical. Um, we know that between us and chimpanzees, it's also like almost like 99% are identical. Um, actually, between us and banana, guess how much we share? We share 40%. So that's that's how how conservative genomes are. Um, so when we come down to like when we, we're interested in human populations, we're looking at diseases, we're looking at our biological variations. What we're most interested in is just this 0.1%. So that's why we want to do genomic variant calling, which is we want to identify what this 0.1% of the difference are there on our genome. Because ultimately, those are the ones that contribute to the, all this phenotypical geno uh, or genetic variations that we see among us. And also like if we're interested in like real world, real world um, uh, questions like disease risks, um, evolutionary histories, this 0.1% is really what matters. So genomic variant calling is just one way of saying we want to find out what this 0.1% are and where they're located. Um, so for if we're looking at our, our genome, there's all different sort of variations we can carry. Um, the simplest type is literally you have one base pair that is different between two individuals or a few individuals. So if we see differences between like, like this point mutations, like or they originate from point mutation, but then eventually we just see this one base pair differences across many individuals, we call those single nucleotide polymorphism. So, well, or sometimes we call that SNPs. Um, so what we're seeing here is like eventually in those VCF files, this is very similar to what we're gonna see there. So what we're seeing here is we're looking at, um, this is our, some like a, a small set of the sequence in Drosophila or fruit fly uh, individuals. So here we're looking at the positions. So there are like maybe 
20 something positions here. And we know what is the, um, um, uh, like, what, like what, what is the nucleotide for this position in um, the, say, uh, most of the individuals. And then we have three populations here. So they represent three, um, I think it's not just three populations, there's probably a different uh, subspecies here. Uh, I forgot what exactly this table is about, but anyway, we can think of it as three species. Um, so we, we, we see that you know, a lot of these positions, they share what most individuals carry at this allele. So, uh, and it is represented by this little dash line here. So what it means is for this population, everybody here carry this uh, allele that we see maybe in the reference genome and in, also in most of the individuals in this species. But if we look at another population, maybe some of them don't have exactly what other, others carry. So in this case, we call this set a variant. And in this case, this is a SNP variant. So if you look at all of this site, some of the sites may not be a variant in a given population, but if you look across um, populations, then they may become a variant. So in population genetics, we also call this type of variants, like as long as if they're not fixed completely, like if we consider this a population, then all of these are variants. They are segregating, which means their, their frequency is not zero or one. But then if we look at this population specifically, like if, we, if you ignore the others, some of this may no longer be variants. In those cases, we don't call them segregating sites. And one unique thing here is for this one in particular, it is a variant, but if we're looking at just of this population, the, the reason why it's a variant because um, this T is different from the C in the reference genome, um, but um, like if you're familiar with some basic population genetics term. Uh, in this case, we call that this variant, uh, this SNP is actually fixed in this population. It's not fixed if we expand our scope and look at all these three. Since it's fixed here, um, it is not a segregating site in terms of this population. But then if we consider everybody all together, it's still a segregating site. Um, so this is just something that um, in case it may get confusing here and there, this is something to clarify. So anyway, what I'm trying to say here is SNP is one of the most common genomic variant. Um, and the term variant is actually a relative term depending on which individuals you're looking at. So something may be a variant um, in one population, but it may not be when in, in another population. So, um, yes. So it's each in the previous slide, uh, What's the heading like ABC is each flight? Yeah, so this here is just like, a, like you can call it individual one, two, three, I four. And so what's the, the this last is column? Just like, the, the last player. column is, um, yeah, we, we don't really need this here, but uh, this is saying whether or not this mutation uh, is non-synonymous or synonymous. So this is more like when you're considering this being like a like a mutation in a protein coding region, whether or not they will confer a difference in terms of the, 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 the coding product. I see. Yeah, so I, like, yeah, so, so we don't really need this here. Like this is just one example that I find maybe straightforward to illustrate what a SNP is. Um, so there are also different type of genomic variants. Sometimes it's more than just one base pair that is involved. So, Whenever there's a variant that involves more than one base pair, um, we call that a structural variation because it, it will change a structure of the genome. So whether or not it is like just a few base pairs or it's like longer than that. In any case, we can group them together. Um, they're called structural var variation. And they're just in contrast to the SNPs, like, like the, a different group of genomic variants. So there are all different ways of like, like having this structural variation. Uh, I'm not gonna go into too much of the details here. Uh, it's just like for your um, uh, uh, interest um, in case you, uh, you, like I think some of you may be very familiar with this if you have taken genetics classes, uh, some of you may not be. So you can have a set of a sequence uh, and with the mutation that actually insert another sequence in it. 
So in that case, we call that insertion. The opposite of that happening is you started with sequence like this, and then suddenly you're missing this whole chunk. In that case, we call that a deletion. You can also have a sequence that doesn't change in length. It's just like simply this part that's swapped. It can happen at times. Um, so we call that inversion. So like visually, they, they look identical, but some of the sequence is actually like swapped in order. Uh, sometimes you may have like one parts that keep repeating itself and result in this copy number variation, or sometimes it's just like one time it duplicates each other. Um, so anyway, these are all different ways of having structural variation. Sometimes you can may, you may have even structural variation on a, on a like um, on a scale of chromosome. Like say you have an entire chromosome that duplicates or missing. In in all of these cases, we we call them genomic variants. Um, but in terms of this workshop, like when we're trying to use GATK to call or to identify these genomic variants, we are not interested in all of them because when we're having like more than one small part of the genome involved, like when we have like a, some copy number variation, or we have like a whole chromosome structural variation, it's actually very hard to map them. Um, so structural variation is a whole different type of class. Um, and and we, we, we don't really talk about that here. So we, when we come down to like using GATK to try to call some of the variants, uh, most of the time we're focusing on SNPs and we can also cover some of those short variants. So if it's an insertion or deletion that doesn't involve like say some megabase of, uh, of the genome, if it's just say like um, some tens of base pair or some hundreds of base pair, um, we can still uh, map them fairly well and identify them. So in any case, we call, we call SNPs and some short uh, uh, insertions and deletions. Well, insertion deletion usually we call them indels. So SNPs plus indels, they're in general, generally speaking, short variants. And those are the ones that for the GATK is powerful at identifying. So if you're interested in other type of genomic variation like those um, copy number variation, like those other type of structural variation, you may want to use a different type of uh, tool. Um, so for GATK, okay, first of all, it focuses on short variants. Um, another term we focus on is it identifies, like, or, or this for this workshop, we're using a tool in GATK that identifies germline short variant. Um, uh, like germline short variants. So what is germline mutations or germline variants? Um, like as the name indicates, uh, germline mutations are the mutations that happens in the germ cells or sperms or eggs. Um, because those are the cells that are involved in the reproduction, um, whatever mutation that happened to the, the, the germ cells are the ones that will get passed on to the next generation. So in terms of like genetics, when we're talking about like, like changes over generations, changes between populations, we're interested in the ones that are inheritable. Like we, we want to see like change like ev or evolution of this uh, variance uh, over time and, and over like, like space scales. So most of the time we're interested in this germline mutations. Um, so there's another group of uh, uh, mutations uh, that doesn't happen to germ cell. Uh, in which case, if they happen to any other body cell except uh, sperms and eggs, we call those somatic mutations. So those also happens all the time. Every time individuals have a cancer, most of the time it's because of mutations to the, to the body cells, like depending on wherever they are. Um, so somatic mutations or somatic variants are very important because a lot of times they're involved in cancers and other diseases. Uh, but since they're not germ cells, they don't get passed on through generations. So uh, GATK does have a tool that helps you identify somatic mutations if that's something of interest in your, in your research, um, but that is not something we're interested in for this specific workshop. So for us, for today and tomorrow, uh, we're interested in using GATK to identify germline short variants or SNPs and indels. No question. Why are the techniques different for these mutations? I mean, the same tools can identify either mutation, right? That's a great question. Um, 
I think well, we can we can go back to the GATK page. They have a they have a a good explanation on that. Uh, intuitively speaking, I think that has something to do with your sequence. Uh, like I think, like I think, if you're interested in somatic var variants, uh, the type of sequence you're gonna obtain, and also uh, like even like the the mapping process may be different. Um, I don't really work with somatic variation, so I don't really have a great answer for that. Um, but I think that's that's a great question, and we can um, go back to GATK page and see what exactly those two uh, the, the two tools uh, vary. Um, so so I, I don't want to give a firm answer here because I don't have exactly that answer in my mind. But yeah, that we can I, I can find out that quickly and send that back to you after after today. Um, Okay, so um, um, for uh, uh, for the type of files we're interested in, uh, we know that before when we're looking at like the raw sequences that are in the FASTQ files, and when we try to map them to a reference genome, we get some SUN file and also BOND file. Uh, for the genomic variants, um, since there's it's just like a small number of them, these files that we're dealing with is much smaller than a bomb file or a fast queue files. Um, so uh, this, the representation for these variants are in the file that we call VCF. Uh, this is literally like some uh, variants, uh, files that, that, that show you the variants. Um, so which means for the GATK tool that we're using to identify um, these variants, we're essentially trying to call this uh, variants in, in our raw sequence and produce them in this VCF format. So um, I don't know if everyone here have seen a VCF before. It looks to me from the Google survey that I did, some of you have seen it, some of you haven't. But anyway, this is a screenshot of a VCF file. Uh, this is something from, from my own research question. I'm just uh, taking a screenshot here. So all of the VCF are almost identical in two ways. Um, there, the basic structure of a VCF is, at uh, first, if you open a VCF file, you can open them in Excel <laughs> or you can open them in R. Uh, in any case, you open, you open these files, you first see a bunch of lines with this double hash. Actually, so I think since I'm sharing all of my screen, it might be easier to look at that here. Okay, this is one of the VCF, VCF files from my work. Uh, you open this and at first you see this double hash stuff like a lot, like after maybe some, a few hundreds of lines, you started with something else. So we call this everything started with two um, hash, we call those header lines. So what they are is they're essentially comments. They are comments that give you information about how the CVCF file is generated, what type of format it is in, even like, like when you're seeing some uh, acronyms later on, what they represent, what type of individuals are here, uh, how many chromosomes are included, um, and even like what type of commands you use to generate this VCFs like over time. So they're all included here. Most of the time we don't like, if you're just looking at the variants, you don't really need to look at these headers. Sometimes even for, for your own convenience, when you're trying to manipulate things like in Python or in R, you may even want to get rid of these headers, but they are useful because sometimes when you're looking at something down here, um, you want to refer, like you see an acronym, you're not sure what they are, you go back here and find like those comments. So after the two uh, hash, eventually you'll come to one line that started with one pound sign. So that is the start of the VCF. And when you're starting with one hash, you, it means like here, here you go, the VCF started, and this is the, the column names or the labels for everything you're gonna see below. So all of the VCFs, the first nine columns uh, are identical. So if you're looking at this nine, um, they're like all of the VCFs, no matter what species, what populations, what like tools you use, they always started with this first nine columns. So what they are, the first one is which chromosome it is on. The second is the genomic position. So it depend depending on the reference genome you use, these positions may vary a little bit, um, but gen generally speaking, they started from a small number to a large number along the chromosome. Uh, you also will see this ID um, column. 
uh, which actually, so if it's a SNP or if it's a short variant that it has been profiled before, um, usually for, for, for this uh, variants, they have been given a name before. So this is just a different way of calling uh, position one uh, at this, uh, how many is this? Like two, uh, around two megabase, 2.5 megabase. Um, this is just a different way of calling this thing. So not all of the variants have an ID. So if it doesn't, it will just, it will just be empty here with a little dot. Um, but sometimes you can look up stuff based on just this RSIDs, or you can look things up by their uh, relative like positions on, on the genome. Um, the next two columns are the reference alleles and the alternate allele. Uh, I have a slide later that will cover what exactly is a reference allele and alternate allele. Uh, generally speaking, reference allele is what you see on the reference genome, and alternate allele is not what you see on the reference genome, it's something else. Um, so this would, so usually here in the ref line, you only have one entry. So you can like, it's either a SNP or it maybe it's a, like a short variant. In any case, you, you only have like one thing in this column. For the alternate ones, it, you not necessarily will have just one thing. So if you just have like one entry here, it means for this specific locus, you only have, you, you only observe two different alleles. So we call those biallelic sites. Um, you may run into this term here and there, say sometimes we have a raw VCF with all sorts of variants and say, we just want to keep the biallelic sites. So when, when you see that term say, okay, we just want the biallelic, it means you want to filter them based on this column here. And you only want things that with only one entry in the alternate allele uh, column. So when, when there's something that is not biallelic, most of the time what you're seeing is, so I'm just gonna edit this here, you may have see things like, like this. So, so there will be other um, um, uh, entries here that are separated by a comma. So usually when you see that, what that means is for this position, you see more than one alternate allele in addition to the reference allele. You may see it, maybe a C, you may see an AC here, or sometimes it's even a longer thing. So, in, um, so that's what these two columns are about. Here is another column that is about the quality score. So when we are calling VCF, later we will see that, like eventually through all, the, all of these processes, um, the program would assign a quality score for each of these calls. So sometimes like, like if you have really good high quality genome, like high coverage, uh, most of these quality scores are great. Um, but depending on the like where they are, sometimes you may have this weird, like a few contexts that are not well aligned. So you may have low quality scores or sometimes like depending on your coverage, if you have low coverage in the first place, maybe most of the quality scores are bad. So those are some information that you can further use for you to filter the VCF later on, like depending on your research project. So this is quality score here. And here is also related to the quality. Um, it's, it may not just be about a specific score. Uh, sometimes we, we, we use all different sort of criteria and those we're gonna cover tomorrow, like how we do filtering for VCF. But anyway, you can assign a label under this and you can call them pass, you can call them not pass, or you can call them like, maybe it has a low score of something else. So anyway, you can assign your own labels here. And this is something that's just helpful for you for, uh, for you to manage the VCF. Like you may not want to keep all of the sites, you may, want to, you may want to get rid of some of the bad ones. So this is just something that you can refer to, like you can, you can filter based on the filter, uh, the filter label here. So the next column is usually really long. So if you try to expand it, you see that, okay, it doesn't even end. It contains a lot of things. So this is some meta information for the population that you're interested in. So this example here is a human population. Um, so in this info here, you see this all this acronym and I may not remember all of them. Some of these are the like allele frequencies, uh, allele count, and uh, what is allele frequency in all different populations. So all of these acronyms in the info part, if, if you don't remember, that's fine. You can refer them back to 
everything here. So all of these things under info, you can find the uh, respective information in your uh, in the headers. Um, so most of the time, depending on what exactly you're doing with the VCF, um, this info column is not directly useful for so if you're calculating like say allele frequencies or other stuffs, but at times say if you want to figure out um, for this population I'm looking at, what is the frequency in some other worldwide populations, you may not need to com compute your own again, you can look it up in the info column. Or sometimes you want to figure out what is that allele in like the, in the what is the ancestral allele in for, for this uh, population uh, or for sorry for 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 this uh, SNP, you can also find out in this column. So the next shared uh, column here is called format. So what it is is it annotates what you're going to see in the rest of your uh, uh, genotypes. So always the first ones you're going to see is genotype. Um, and it may follow by some uh, other information that is related to this genotype. So let's look at a different example here. This one looks better. Okay, so this one here is a different VCF. So for here, you can see that this format, other than the genotype, it also includes a bunch of other informations. Um, so I think I included an example here uh, that maybe we can see it more clearly if we, if we uh, open this up. Um, so this is just a zoom in of this cell here, which is the same as uh, this table that I'm showing you here. Okay, so if we zoom in at one of the cells, what it is showing is um, everything is separated by uh, columns here. So um, if you look at things like, so there are like, what, like one, two, three, four, five different information included in this genotype cell. And what they are is the first one, the GT represent for genotype and an AD, you can find it in the header, AD is allele depth. Um, and the next one is the total read depth. Uh, and also you have the genotype quality, you also have a, a fresh scale genotype likelihood. Uh, okay, so what they are is, we're saying that for this position, there is, there is a reference genome and there's an alternate, sorry, there's a reference allele, there's an alternate allele. Uh, usually for the genotypes, we call the reference alleles zeros. So since the, all of the reference entries, there's only one entry here. So there's only one zero here. So all of these are the zeros in the genotypes that we're seeing. Um, and the alternate allele, depending on how many entries are here, it is a number starting from one to whatever. So say you have only one alternate allele, then the one here is going to be this one. So, so then for, for this position, for example, there are two types of alleles and we call that this individual have genotype zero slash one. It means that for that individual at this position, the genotype is TG. So it's just like a way, like we don't want to write ATCG here because that may be very messy to look at. Uh, we just use zero and ones to represent which alleles this individuals carry. Um, if you have more than one alternate allele, so it's, if it's not biallelic, so you have like a, maybe a G here and maybe a, like a GT here, like maybe this is a structural variation. Uh, in that case, whatever the second one is going to be two instead of one. So you have zero, one, two, sometimes you have three, maybe you can even have four. Um, so this uh, genotype, this uh, code here will just represent which alternate allele you're, you're looking at. Um, this other information, um, depending on, again, depending on what you're doing with the VCF, they may or may not be useful. So read depth is, um, later we're gonna see that how we actually call these genotypes. Um, it actually depends on, so, so you guys all know like this, uh, um, the you know, NGS class, you see that for each position, it has scanned multiple times uh, in this uh, sequencing reads. So say for this position, this is a high coverage genome, the overall read depth at this, uh, at this position is 28. 
which means if you're looking at this bound file, this, this read alignment, you, you may count it 28 times. Among these 28 times, 25 of the time, you're counting zeros, like, or you're seeing that in 25 of those reads, you're seeing the reference allele. Only three of them, you're seeing the alternate allele. But since you do see two of them alternating, uh, in this case, it called a this genotype here zero slash one. So it's instead of everything being reference allele, it says this is a heterozygous here. Um, so depending on um, like all the overall quality and also how many like read depth are there, eventually you can assign a genotype quality score through the program. You don't need to worry about that here. And the last one here, this is a PL. Um, it may come useful depending on if you want to filter your VCF by um, like how much do you believe this genotype is really what it is. So what it is, is it is a minus 10 times a log likelihood ratio of the probability of this genotype. So the probability of this, of this genotype being this, given the data you see. So this is a minus log likelihood, which means um, if you do a, like some quick math, the lower the value you see here, the higher the probability this genotype is what it is. So uh, you see three numbers here because you only have two alleles. It's either zero or ones. So everything is, um, uh, so we're talking about human here. Everything has like two alleles for each individual. Um, you can only have like for all the genotypes you can have is either zero zeros or zero ones or one ones. So this is saying that given this, this um, minus uh, this free scale uh, likelihood, the highest probability of this likelihood is actually zero ones, which is being called here. And the chance this, uh, this position may be actually a zero zero is not super high, but it, I mean, you, you do see more zeros than ones here. And the chance this is a one one genotype is super low. So we read this reversely. The lower the number it is, the higher the probability of the genotype. So the order of this is reference slash reference, reference slash alternate, and alternate slash alternate. So this is how we read a VCF. Um, uh, like after you have seen a few of them in your, in your own research, it will get really clear. Like the first nine, they're all shared. And the, 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 from this column on is each column represents one individual. And most of the time what you're interested in is the genotype here. Uh, um, yes. So the third row, why does it say zero, zero, although it's spelled G to T? Um, it says zero, zero for this individual. Um, it has an alternate allele and that alternate allele may not be seen in every individual. So usually you have a VCF that is, uh, so this is a thousand genome human, human, human project. You see a huge, um, like you can have like a lot of individuals you can have like literally a thousand of them. So the alternate allele may be seen somewhere among this. Okay huge population, but not in that given individual. Um, so if you noticed another thing that, uh, well, now that I'm here already, like I show you two examples of VCF. You may see that in some cases, you see the genotypes like the zero, one, zero, zeros, they're being separated by a slash. But sometimes you see things like this that are separated by uh, how do you call this symbol? Like this little line here. So the difference between these two is whether or not you are calling haplotypes in addition to the genotype. So what, what we mean by haplotype is um, for um, if you're thinking about like, like one generation making another generation, like, like in this reproduction process, uh, we know that sperms and eggs, they carry literally half of your uh, genomic information. So uh, which uh, of the, so say you have like a few sites here um, and they all have their own genotype, which ones like are segregating together versus the other, uh, we may or may not know. So if we know the haplotype, which is we know uh, well, 
maybe here, like if you're looking at this a few, like some of them are all zeros, it doesn't really matter, but some of them is like zero and ones. Uh, we, we may not, like if we don't know the haplotype, we know th for this position at this individual, it is zero ones. So there's, there's two things that can happen here, but we don't know which is going along with the rest of the variants here. Um, so in that case, we have just a genotype, we don't know the haplotype. So we call those type unfazed. So whenever you see a slash, it means we just know the genotype, but we can't call the haplotype yet um, because we don't know which ones are, we don't have enough information yet to know which ones are segregating together with others. So this slash is called unfazed genotype. Um, you see them a lot, especially for uh, whatever is being generated by GATK, everything you get is unfazed. To call haplotype, like to figure out which ones are segregating together with others, um, it involves another set of methods that we're not gonna cover here, but just for your own interest, this is a um, separate analysis called haplotype estimation. It involves a lot of statistical models. But anyway, when you have a phased uh, VCF, it means that you can trust this little line here. So whatever on the left are being segregating together, like they're one haplotype and whatever on the right is one haplotype. So this is something that you may notice when you read different type of VCFs. All right, now let me just close this guys. I don't need this anymore. Um, so another concept that is important when we're talking about different alleles, there, okay, this is not necessarily needed for the GATK variant calling per se, but they are a important concept when we're talking about VCF. So I think ultimately the goal here is to generate a VCF and to even understand what you can do with VCF. So a lot of times we're talking about, we're using these names. Um, we have just mentioned reference allele versus alternate allele, uh, depending on whether or not you see that allele on the reference genome. Uh, there are all these other terms that people also use. So one of them is called major allele versus minor allele. So what that means is uh, major allele is literally the most common allele you see in a, in a given population for a given locus. And whatever that is not a major allele, um, especially if it's a biallelic, the other one we call that minor allele. So you, sometimes you may encounter that as people ask you, look at this VCF, get the minor allele frequencies. Okay, then you're going to figure out like, given this VCF, figure out first which one of the two alleles that you see less common. And then that, that allele frequency is the one you're looking at. Um, a lot, some other times people are talking about ancestral alleles versus derived alleles. So ancestral allele is, for example, your, if your, your question is human, um, you're looking at humans and chimpanzees. We know that human and chimps, we share a common ancestor somewhere back there. So whatever allele that is observed in that last common ancestor, we call that ancestral alleles. Um, and whatever happened on the specific state, on a specific human lineage in contrast to chimps, uh, we call that a derived allele. Um, so it, it is very easy to get confused with them. Sometimes you may have a reference allele that is the major allele and also happen to be ancestral allele, um, but sometimes it may not be the case. So every two here are in contrast to each other, but between the two sets, sometimes you're talking about the same thing, sometimes you're not. So they're not necessarily interchangeably useful, uh, usable. Um, so really depending on what you're talking about. So for the VCF we're going to look at, uh, which is the output of GATK, uh, we're only dealing with reference and alternate, but just make sure that in your own research question, when people ask you figure out what is the ancestral allele frequency, uh, you don't just take the reference allele, you need to double check that the reference allele also needs to be the ancestral allele. So this is just something to keep in mind. Uh, we seen, we've seen this already, uh, haplotype facing, okay. Um, so uh, depending on um, your research, uh, the reason why GATK haplotype uh, or GATK uh, variant calling is really important is, for example, in my work, 
uh, I'm a population geneticist. I work most of times with um, publicly available data. So I almost never need to deal with bomb file or fastq files. Most of the time what I'm getting is already the VCFs. So I most of the time work like I will say 99% of the time I work with VCF and forward. And it's only when I'm looking at some really weird things, like, like I, I see something like outstanding on the VCF, I'm not sure if I trust that, then I go back to the bomb file. So really depending on your specific research project, um, especially if you're dealing with a lot of um, uh, publicly available data, um, VCF is probably your best friend. And so here we're just trying to understand overall how in general we're getting the VCF files. Um, just in case, even if you just you work exclusively with VCF files, at times you want to figure out if you want to trust a specific genotype call. And in that case, you need to know how it went from the raw sequence all the way to VCF. So um, for the rest of this workshop, we're going to keep encountering all, several different types of uh, uh, file types. Um, I'm sure all of you have been familiar with like these three types here, the, the FASTA file, uh, which is the one that uh, we're going to, going to encounter for the reference uh, genome, because for that one, all we need is the, the sequence. Uh, and also the FASTQ files, which is the raw sequences you're going to eventually generate um, uh, variant calls from. And we also have the BOM file, which is intermediate ones, which is this FASTQ files mapped against the reference genome. So uh, in your NGS workshop, you have covered all that. So we're going to deal with two types of output for the v GATK workflow. We mentioned what is a VCF file. Uh, and there's another type, which, is, which looks almost identical to a VCF file, but slightly different. Uh, so that file is an intermediate output, and which is the first output we're going to get from GATK. It is called a GVCF file. So what G stand for is a, instead of VCF, it is a genomic variant call format. So it is called a VCF, but it's actually confusing because it sounds like this file also just include the variants. Um, but instead, this file includes the genotype for all of your genomic positions. So it, it includes variants and also the non-variants. Um, so for VCF, for example, if you noticed, like in the example I gave a few slides ago, um, if you're looking at these positions, they're not consecutive. Like you have position like 3 million, whatever. The next one is not, instead of like four, five, one, you have maybe like you skip like 16 positions and you have this in your VCF file. It doesn't mean everything in the middle does not exist. They all exist. What it means is all everything in the middle here are not variants. They all look identical and they all look like the reference allele. So we don't, since they're not variants, we don't include those in the VCF. But GVCF would contain the information for every single position. So if you're looking at a like this GVCF intermediate output, like this file is so much larger and all of these uh, positions in theory are consecutive but not the VCF file. So for GATK, this is our ultimate input and this is our output and VCF file is the ultimate ones that we're interested in. Like we can eventually ignore, like we'll get rid of the GVCF and we use GVCF to get the VCF calls. Um, so this is the GATK workflow um, that we're uh, interested in. So it, uh, in general, com um, uh, consists of three parts. So um, depending on our schedule, um, we, I, I, I don't, I think we can well cover the first part. We may cover, cover some of this and the rest, this part for sure, we're gonna leave until tomorrow. So, so what it means is it is, this um, flow chart tells us how we go from the raw sequence reads all the way to VCF. So it includes three components. The first component is to get a BOM file that is good enough to call VCF to, or to call variants. So in your NGS class, you may have worked with, the, with, with this part that you have your route reads in FASTQ files. 
um, you have your reference genome, you map them against your reference genome, you get some BOM file. You may not, I, I'm not sure, like I, correct me if I'm wrong, like I think you didn't cover in your NGS class that given a original BOM file, how you do some uh, different like, like alignments uh, or, or calibration to get a BOM file that is good for variant coding. Um, so we're going to focus on here, uh, especially for today, that how we get a BOM file that is ready to go. The next part is the variant coding part. So this is given we have this BOM file that we generated from this first part, um, how we get the GVCF files and then eventually how we get the VCF files. So after this part, we will get some VCF files that looks like they are ready for analysis. But, in, but before we actually use those VCF for analysis, um, we need to actually look at, like, remember for the VCF files, we have all these like columns that contains the quality. So there's quality score, there's also quality filters. So depending on what they look like, you may want to further uh, filter something out, refine this VCF files to make them actually ready for your own research. So this is in general how GKT could work. And for today, we're just going to go from part to part to see how we set up codes for each part of them. Um, so we have three hours in total. Now is we have passed one hour. Do you guys want to take a 10 minute break and we come back here? Because I mean, for three hours, I think what I'm thinking is we can take maybe two short breaks, like at every one hour, just in case we're like, we get Zoom fatigue. <laughs> um, so if that sounds good, uh, we can, so right now is 2.32. What if we come back here at 2.40, like, like eight, nine minutes? Yeah, I'm gonna pause the recording for now. So you guys can go grab a coffee and do, do whatever. And we're gonna be, be here at uh, 2.40. Okay, so let's start back again. Um, so where I was, well, one second, let me share the screen. Okay, is the screen sharing working for now? Okay, good. Um, okay, so where we're left with is this is the, uh, uh, this is the uh, workflow for GATK. So let's start with some intuition with variant calling. So I think I kind of like, like kind of like mentioned that already, like in, when I was talking about VCF. But anyway, so like before we look at the specific functions in GATK, we wanted to understand like how variant calling in general works. So we said that we started with raw sequence. Um, in the FASTQ files, we have the sequences and then we can uh, map them like using BWA for like for human-like organisms. We, we map them against the reference genome. Okay, now we have raw sequences. We know where they're lying and we have a BAM file. Um, the next thing is we wanted to know before we get variant, we wanted to know the genotype for all of the positions, uh, which is similar to that GVCF file that I just mentioned earlier. Um, so for all of these positions, we wanted to know what the genotype is. So then for, a, for each of a given position to figure out what is a genotype, it is essentially looking at all of these raw sequence reads that are stacked up at this position in your BOM file. And for this position that we're interested in, like what is the call in each of these reads? So say if you say, intermediately coverage, like say you have 15 reads. Um, so for, for this 15 reads, maybe all of them say one thing. If that's the case, we're good. We have that genotype being, I mean, depending on what that read is, it's either zero zeros or zero ones. But in any case, that is a homozygous. Uh, but if sometimes you have uh, some of them say one thing, some of them say the other, or some of them say even something else, then we know that is, maybe a heterozygous. Whether or not it's a real heterozygous, depending on the quality and also like how, how, how this reads are aligned. Like, so there are some hidden algorithms that deal with that. But in general, like if you th intuitively think about 
how we determine the genotype. It is like so that we have a bomb file that is well clean that we trust and we'll just look at for each position what the reads are and depending on what they are we call them different genotypes and then we once we have the genotype reads for all of our individuals then we look across our samples so as i said variant is a relative term it really depends on your population or the individuals you, you selected something may or may not be a variant but even if it's not a variant all this information are in, already included in this variant calling so say in the vcf file eventually you get you may cross off some things from the gvcf that are non-variants but they actually do exist because you know that for the ones that are eventually not included in the VCF, they are just the reference allele. So you can fill them up when you try to merge VCFs between populations. So if there's something that is not a variant in one population, but it is a variant in another, and you want to merge them together to make one big VCF, you can't fill those missing part up because they're not actually missing. They are, you know, they're all zero zeros. Um, so that's how VCF merging works. Like you can manipulate these files eventually. So this is our intuition with variant calling. It sounds really simple. We just need to determine genotypes and then eventually we figure out which ones vary, which ones don't. Um, so when we specifically uh, manipulate, the, manipulate that in GATK, we're essentially doing four major steps. So three steps of them are involved in GATK. And there's one step, I think you, I'm pretty sure you all have done that, but I'm just gonna cover that briefly here in case um, it's been a while since you take the NGS class. So the first step, which is completely outside of GATK is simply to map your reads to a reference genome the, to generate the bound file. The second part starts to involve GATK, but not exactly. Uh, which is to clean and prepare your bomb file so that it's good to call variants. Um, so we're going to show like what, what, what type of codes that is. And the third part, which is the first main part that completely just involved GATK, this part is to identify the genotypes at all positions at each sample. So this is a part where we're getting GVCFs from the bomb file. So there is one major function or program in GATK that we're going to use, which is called the haplotype caller. Um, so lastly, we're again, completely in GATK, we're going to consolidate all of this GVCF that we got from different samples and jointly call variants among all samples in the given population or cohort, whatever you call that. So this is a process where we're going from GVCFs to VCFs. So here, this part, we're going to involve two functions in GATK. One is dealing with how to consolidate this GVCF together. And the other is, uh, is about uh, jointly call variants given this consolidated GVCFs. So that sounds really simple. So let's look at specifically how we get that. So, um, um, I'm not going to go with like how you set up this. I assume everybody knows this already. Uh, just one thing that I will remind you is to, if you try to like uh, do this interactive uh, practice, uh, make sure you re uh, ask for enough memories. Um, I will say at least ask for four gig of memories so that because GATK runs in Java um, and if it's too small, it's not really going to run. So uh, I figure this set like this is a memory per process, it's a memory per given job. This should be more than enough for dealing with our uh, practice data. But if this is smaller than 4K and you may have issues, it should be, it should take just a few seconds to get a node using this. So let's see, this is what I have here. I'm just, let's, uh, we can do this together or we can just see what I'm doing. And I, I gave you all my codes already. You can copy paste them on your, on, on your own end, like after after this, but just I'm just trying to show like how specifically this works. So say I log into a node and I change directory to where I put all the data. Um, so um, well, I, I have I have changed into this here already. 
uh, make sure, like I think you all have access to this directory. Uh, that's how the scratch works. I also just found out recently, like I thought I need to just change mod like 777 for everything, but it turned out, oh, everything is accessible in scratch. Um, so uh, make sure when you work on this data, you get a copy in your own directory because this is the only copy I have. So I'm trying not to uh, make something weird happen here. Um, so before we do anything with this directory, um, we can load all of these models. Um, so those include um, the BWA, Java, the PyCard, which is a part that we're going to use to clean the bomb file. Also the GATK itself. Um, there's these two other things that may be useful, sun tools. Um, does everyone here know how to use sun tools? Like, I hope you cover that in the NGS. Uh, if not, we can, I mean, I have some uh, SAM tools code that I give as example. Um, so this is something that will just help us to manipulate the BOM file to, to view that because BOM file is in binary format. You can directly see what is, what is in it. This thing, we're not gonna need this yet, but eventually once we have a VCF files, we're gonna need some tools to manipulate the VCF files. Um, so there are different tools we can use. My favorite is BCF tools. There's another very similar thing called VCF tools. Uh, you can load that tool. It's also a module. So if you do module load VCF files, sorry, VCF tools, you can also get something. So those, we don't need those yet, but tomorrow we'll need those. So you can just load them anyway. It doesn't take anything. So the first thing is we want to make sure that everything we just loaded works <laughs> or in another word, we know they all work, but um, nobody's gonna remember like all the like functions, like, like the options, like, like you need to type after you, like after you call the program. So one easy thing to find out is it literally you call the program and ask you to, to give you a printout of all the options you can't give there. So for example, this program is called PyCard. PyCard is, is a really useful tool for doing a lot of things, specifically for our stuff. Uh, this is, uh, we're going to use some functions in PyCard to help us prepare a BOM file that is good to go. So if you literally just do java-jar, so this is where, like this is the, uh, the path of where that uh, the JavaScript for PyCard is located on Hoffman cluster. So you can call this directly as is, or if you don't want to type a ton of things, or if you don't want to copy paste this, you can set your own path for GATK for PyCard, because for GATK is the same thing that on um, Hoffman is located somewhere and you, you, you can type that whole thing or uh, you can explore your own path. So it saves you some typing time. But anyway, if I just copy paste this and here, I okay, call that. Mm, what's going on here? Did I not even request enough memory? Um, anyway, so um, in theory, this should give me a, uh, a printout of what options are there in PyCard. Let's see what out of memory arrow. Okay, give me one second. Let me request something again. Load all my modules. Okay. Now go this. Okay, there you go. Okay, I don't know what happened there. Anyway, so this is when you're just calling PyCard. It gives you all of the options it has. So the ones we're going to use is just like a literally a couple of them. We're going to use it to mark duplicates, uh, which is here. 
So if you do your command, and, and another thing we're going to use is to change the regroup, like that's just a way to, um, to change the annotation in your BAM file. Um, but the first thing we're going to use is this. So if you want to know all the options you can deal with with PyCard, you can call PyCard and call mark duplicates, and it should give you all the options that it requires. Um, so this is just a test to see that PyCard works. Another thing is for GATK. So there are two ways to call GATK on Hoffman. One is very similar to how we call PyCard that we call Java and we find where GATK is located. There are all different type of packages on GAT, of GATK on Hoffman. Um, I would recommend to use GATK4. So I think there are several versions of GATK4 on Hoffman. Anyone should work, they, they're not that different. But between GATK4 and GATK3, there's quite some difference. So any of these GATK will work. So if you just do this, it would give you a very similar printout as the pie card. There. So that's you, you're calling this through Java. Another way of calling GATK is since we loaded the GATK module already, it means we can like bypass Java here and call GATK from there. So if you copy paste this, it will give you exactly the same printout as just now, see here. So this is essentially doing the same thing as what we just did. So with this, you, you can see all of the functions that you can call from GATK, and then you can call them specifically to see what, what type of inputs it requires, just because nobody remembers any of this like options. Um, I, I never remember those. So I, I use this as a way to help me figure out, okay, which I'm gonna use, what type of input uh, options are there. Um, so one thing specifically is uh, when you're calling GATK, since it, it is essentially a Java thing, um, you need to, like, you can't call GATK by itself. It'll, it'll give you an error and ask you, you need to specify Java options. So the only options it is mandatory to specify is how much memory you need. So that's why earlier we said, well, we want four gig of memory. So here you can do four gig, or if you request it more on your interactive node, or when you submit a job, you can put more here. Uh, I think four gig for what we're doing should be enough. So here, uh, what I'm showing here is like a screenshot of the printout um, in case uh, I hope it's all working on your end, but if not, like this is your reference of how it should look like when you just call GATK by itself without specifying anything else. Um, so um, before we go into the details, uh, and especially after this workshop, I'm sure you're gonna work on your own for the GATK things, uh, in your own research. Um, and I'm sure you're gonna run into questions or errors or whatever things you wanna figure out that is not covered in in this workshop. So GATK website uh, from the Broad Institute is your best friend. Um, I wish when I was learning GATK, I could attend a workshop like this, but I there, there, there wasn't anything available. So I literally learned everything through this website by myself, uh, which means you can do that too. Uh, so every time you run into questions uh, or, or errors, just Google it and you can always refer them back to the GATK website. They have very, very helpful um, tutorials and also troubleshooting um, um, uh, uh, discussions that most of the questions that you will have can be answered through this website. So this is a just a really helpful reference for your future use. Um, it should have most of the things covered. Um, the only, uh, uh, like tricky thing here is when you Google your question, uh, you see things like that are explained by the GATK website. You need to double check if they're talking about GATK three or GATK four, um, because as I mentioned earlier, those two have like there are something quite different that uh, something that sort of something you have to do in GATK three, but you no longer need to do that in GATK four. Um, so yeah, it's like when you're trying to search things by yourself. Uh, make sure that like it is talking about JATK4. 
uh, because they, they look very alike, but they are slightly different. Um, so another some set of basic syntax that we can uh, look at is we can use send tools to view our BOM file. Um, and eventually we're gonna need BCF tools, but so anyway. So what I'm gonna show here is now I'm in my directory with all the practice data you guys are gonna need. So if you look at what they are, this is um, downloaded publicly available data from the thousand genome project. So for a thousand genome project, most of the time, like in my work, for example, I deal with their VCFs, uh, but they also have all of their BOM files available. Um, so you can fully download those. They're just, they're just humongous. Um, so clearly I'm not gonna down download all of them. So these are eight individuals. Uh, so every three files is uh, a set of individuals. So this is things for one individual, another. So there are eight of them. Um, this includes the BOM file, the BOM index, and also some other stuff. Um, and uh, they are not the whole genome for these eight individuals. They are just the chromosome 20, which is conveniently provided by a thousand genome already. Like they gave their chromosome 20, like in addition to their whole genome. Um, they did that, I think it's for their um, uh, sanity checking things, but for, for us, like this is a fairly small data set. Like instead of downloading a few gig, like each of them should be like 200 something megabits. Um, so I figured this is a good practice set for our thing, which means when we're eventually calling VCF from these BOM files, we're only gonna get chromosome 20. We're not gonna get the entire genome. Um, which is okay for the practice sake, um, but just keep that in mind. In your work, most of the time, what you're dealing with is a whole genome. It's not just one chromosome. Um, so we want to, maybe you want to just do some quick check what this BOM file look like. They look identical to any other BOM file you can think of. <laughs> uh, so you can use SAM tools to view the first 10 record uh, to figure out at least, okay, you know, for it started from about uh, 60 uh, KB uh, for the chromosome 20 and from then on. And you can also use SAM tools to view like specific range of chromosome 20. Uh, also make one thing you may want to like, so this is just showing the record of this, uh, wait, did I not copy? Where did it go? This should be a small range. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so for a small range, like how this uh, BAM file looks like. Um, so by now, I think you all should be familiar, fairly familiar with what these different columns are. Anyway, this is where your, uh, your, your, your read starts and this is the entire read, which chromosome it is. Um, so one thing to keep in mind for this specific practice data set is for this specific set, all these chromosomes are labeled as uh, the chromosome, like, so instead of like CHR20, they call this just 20, um, which is fine. Um, but this is something that like, if you're using your own like, like human genome, and if you look at like how they're calling this chromosome, sometimes they may or may not include this. So it doesn't matter right now, but it matters when you're say, you want to view a specific interval of your, your bond. Like here you are gonna type 20, but if depending on how your uh, sequence is worked, you may want to add the CHR, whatever they, they, they call these chromosomes. Uh, so see here, if I call this C, like chromosome 20 instead of just 20, it's gonna throw me arrows because you can't find this chromosome because this chromosome is labeled just as 20 here. Um, so another thing is when you're using a reference genome, um, so for the human reference genome I'm using here, it's also like I'm using the version that it has uh, just like, it, it doesn't have the, this, the string part for the chromosome. Um, so, I mean, this is some, something really small, like, like I, I mean, I noticed that when I was preparing for this um, um, practice data set, but I think that may be something that is common to throw you errors depending on the data you have. 
Um, so sometimes the BAM file you have, like if you download BAM file from some source, they may or may not have the by uh, index file. So you can use send tools to index the BAM file. Um, that should, should be fairly fast. Um, so for BCF tools, this is just like, like we're going to use that for, to manipulate our BCF files eventually. And also there's like, I'm gonna mention somewhere that there are some existing data that we need to use to do some calibration. And that, if you want to view some a few records, these are some sample BCF tools command. Um, you can also like, since you loaded the BCF tools already, you can literally type it and it's gonna give you most of the things, what you can do with this. You can view record, you can sort them, you can convert them and annotate it. Like there, there's a bunch of things you can do with BCF tools. But anyway, this is some, the basic syntax we're going to run into. Um, another really useful program that we're going to, uh, well, I, I'm not gonna talk too much about like IGV here. It's called Integrative Genomic Viewer. So this is a really helpful software. I don't know if in your NGS workshop they covered this. Uh, anyway, this is a really useful program where it allows you to visualize your BOM file. So instead of like looking them like this, which is very hard to read, it's almost impossible. You want to know exactly like how your, how your reads align to each other. And if there's like, sometimes you may have a part of chromosome that is not well covered. So in that case, you download this program. Um, it, I, I don't know if there, there might be a Linux version. I don't know how to do that. So on my Mac computer, you can literally just download this as, as an app and you can load what is your reference genome. So in this case, I'm using the human HG19, uh, which is slightly older, uh, uh, coordinate system, but it's not super out, out, uh, outdated. And what you do is you load your BOM in this and you can see, okay, how your, how your reads are aligned. Uh, and if there's some part that, so for example, that is not well covered. Um, so if you try to load your entire BOM file here, like if it's a whole genome, even for just chromosome 20, this is gonna take a lot of, like you need to, like for the convenience, if you want to do that on your local computer, you don't want to download a few gig of things and load them all into your memory. It's, it's, your computer is probably gonna shut. Um, one thing that will be helpful is, I use this just for sanity check. So say in retrospect, I figure there's an interval that I'm not sure what is going on. I just extract them using SAM tools. I extract a specific region, um, on my, from my BAM file. So that'll be a really small file that I can easily download and load them to IGV to, to literally see them. Um, so, so for GATK variant calling, this, we don't necessarily need this, but a lot of times when we're like, I feel most of the time when we're doing research, we're doing troubleshooting. So this is just something that, this is where you can download this to your local computer. And this is a good way to, to do sanity check. So I'm not going to go through the details of um, um, the map reads uh, because I assume by now you all should know that. Uh, and another reason why I'm not gonna give an example here is because I don't want to download the, the FASTQ file. Um, that, that's a lot of things. So I'm just gonna give the sample codes here. This is how it works. If you're like in your research, you're dealing with starting from the raw sequence, um, this is what you're gonna, gonna need. So first you download a reference genome. Uh, most like, I mean, unless you're dealing with some really rare uh, study system, most of the organisms you're dealing with have a, like quite a few reference genome that you can download. So for human, um, so the Broad Institute have a very good combo of resource that contains not just a reference genome, but also other stuff that we're gonna encounter later. But anyway, we can, download those literally, like we can choose a reference genome to download. So I'm, I'm using the HG19 um, after you download that. Um, so I think the Broad Institute included their, the, the index of the FASA file, but in case it doesn't, you can create an index under the BWA um, and you can create like a, like a, uh, like FASA5 file uh, 
uh, under some tools. And this is just how, like, and you can create a dictionary uh, for this. So the faster, um, the FASA.fi and also the dictionary, these are essentially the three files you need for a reference genome. So for our stuffs, I did that all for you already. Um, so if you go to the reference genome folder in this package that I gave you, it included this reference genome we're going to use. So it includes the FASTA file, the FI, and also the dictionary and also some other stuffs. Um, these three are the three things you need for your reference genome directory. Um, so the, the human genome, most of the times you can download all three already, you don't need to prepare them, but sometimes you, all you have is a FASTA file and you need to uh, prepare them a little bit. So anyway, so this is like if we go back to our general directory, we have our BAM file here, we have our reference genome under a, a different directory. It doesn't have to be a separate directory, but just so you're not meddling things together, it's always clean to create a different directory there. Um, so, so, and also here on the fastest, fastest index file, you can also see how your reference genome is labeling their chromosomes. So remember earlier I mentioned that in the BOM file, chromosome 20 is labeled as 20, not CHR20. So in the reference genome, you, I also have these chromosomes that are labeled as just numbers instead of like CHR or whatever. So need to, you need to make sure that your reference genomes index for the chromosomes or the contigs are the same as your BOM file contig labeling. Um, it's easy to change that if they don't match, but eventually they need to match to, to continue further. And that's, that's just a common error source. Um, so this is something you probably all know already. Um, you have your, uh, now you have prepared a reference genome. You have your FASTQ files for your uh, raw reads. You need to make a, a raw BOM file. And this is where we're starting at. And we clearly, we didn't do that. We downloaded a BOM file already, but this is how this file should look like. Okay. So the next is the real thing is going to start. The next part is we need to prepare our BOM file in several ways. Uh, the first thing of all that we need to do is we need to mark the duplicates or the duplicate reads in our BOM files. So that involves uh, the PyCard um, uh, program that we just mentioned. So under PyCard, we saw that PyCard has a gazillion um, different type of programs. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the mark duplicates. We're going to call this function. So this function takes one input, which is just your BOM file. It gives you one output. Oh, sorry, two outputs. It gives you a BOM output that is like it gets rid of the, the duplicates. And it also gives you a summary of what it did. So these two that you're going to specify here are the output, in which case it's gonna give you a BOM file that you, you're gonna use for your next steps. Um, so I just label this DW, um, the BOM file, and it's gonna give you a sampled metric. So this step, it should be fairly fast to run. I can just run that quickly here so that you know how it works. So uh, I call my PyCard, you can type it your own and, or you can copy paste this, but I figure when you're learning, uh, sometimes typing your own always help you figure out like what, what exactly is going on. So, okay, I call PyCard, I call mark duplicates, I specify my input, which is this long name, and I name it the output, which is the original name plus, like I need to mark this, and this is my output. All right, let's just run this quickly. It's gonna take maybe one minute. Mm, no, didn't work. <laughs> uh, damn it. What was the error? Memory thing again? Weird. Um, okay, I don't know what is going on. I can just request a little more memory. Um, I tested it earlier before the class started, everything worked, and I don't know why it keeps throwing me at memory error, but it may happen to you too. So 
Usually what I do is for everything that I'm going to show as example, I submit them as a job script. So in the job, you can request more things. Uh, you can request a little more resource than you actually need. Don't request way too much. That's gonna slow things down. It's gonna make things like stuck in queue. But uh, anyway, let's see if it now allows me to do this. Yeah, I think now it's working. Okay, so this is the correct output of this process. Um, you call these things, ask you to uh, mark your duplicates. And after a while, like it looks like it's all running. There's no error. If, it, there's, an, if there's an actual error, it's gonna stop and you're gonna know. Um, so it looks like it's gonna finish. And I'm gonna show you what the output looks like. So also remember that when I specify the input, like if you still remember how all my files look like, there are eight individuals. So I'm doing each individuals one by one. So this process, you can do everything all together. You can do like just like, like star all of these things. You, you can't do that. You have to do them one by one. So when you're doing the assignment, like when you're trying to get like prepare BOM file and also eventually get a VCF, um, depending on how your job queues look like, uh, like if you don't have a lot of things running, like you have a lot of resources open up, you can run all eight of them uh, and give me a VCF that includes all eight, that's fine. Um, if you have like, like if some debugging is taking a long time and you just have time to run a few of them, I mean, first of all, you can parallelize them. So you can submit one script that like it takes different like, like uh, ID names. Um, so in theory, as long as your, your uh, Hoffman can take say eight jobs altogether, um, it shouldn't take that long. But anyway, if you have a few of them, so it's a, it's a cohort, it's not just one individual, uh, like we're gonna identify variants among a few individuals, that's fine. So if you give me like five individuals, that, that, that's okay too. But anyway, I, I gave you eight, even eight like in pra practically, they are not even considered a population, but this is just some, some, some practice. Okay, it looks like it finished the first process. So now if we look at our directory, now it gave us like in addition to this original files we have, it gave us a new BOM file and it gave us a metric output. So this BOM file is what you're going to use for your next steps. So from now on, the original, this is original for this individual. We no longer need this. All we need is this. So um, sometimes like, so like, like after this a few steps, we're gonna generate a few intermediate bomb file. Um, what you can do is you keep the last one. Like you keep the first one, you keep the last one. And after every step, you, if they're taking too much like, like disk space, you can get rid of those intermediate ones. Um, keep the original one because that's the original one like if anything goes wrong you have your reference like like at least i can start from scratch again um keep the last one like the ready to go bomb because that's the one that goes into vcf so if you are doing like troubleshooting you, you think the problem didn't come from when you're preparing the bomb file you don't need to rerun this bomb cleaning again you can just go between bomb to like couple type calling uh like the gatk part so, so yeah, so this is just like, we're going to generate a few intermediate things. So with all eight individuals, and remember this is just chromosome 20. So if you're dealing with like a whole genome, like each BOM file could be a, like 30 gig. <laughs> um, so you don't wanna keep so many copies of th those, like they may take a lot of space. So keep the first and keep the last intermediate ones. Once you finish using them, you can get rid of them. 
Um, okay, so this is the first part. We can mark duplicates. Now we generated a new BOM file. The next thing is it is not strictly necessary depending on how your original BOM file looked like, but this is just like something to, like this is a step to annotate our BOM files. We want to assign uh, uh, indiv uh, individuals with uh, like what is their population name, what is their individual ID name. So because sometimes your raw reads may just come like fresh off the bench and individuals may just literally be labeled like one, two, three, four, five. If you want to rename them to something else, um, you can do that in this step. And if you want to assign them to a population name, you can do that here too. So here, if you look at this, um, it calls PyCard again. It used a different uh, function called add or replace read groups. It takes one input, which is the new BOM file you just generated after you mark the duplicates, and it's going to give you another BOM output, uh, which you can label them as like read group, um, ddub, like whatever BOM file. So it's going to give you another BOM file here. And the rest here is to specify how you want to add or change your read groups. So the first here is um, the population name. So your original uh, BOM file may not include that information, so you can add it here. So uh, since I downloaded this data set from 1,000 genomes, uh, and I know these are the British individuals, they are like, I, I'm pretty sure there they included this already, but I, I mean, in case it doesn't, you can say, okay, the population name is the the British, like the GBR population from a thousand genome. Um, you can give it a library name, um, whatever you want to call this. And also you can annotate which sequencing platform it came off of. So uh, these ones, they come from uh, alumni, uh, Illumina. Um, so you can write that here. And also you can specify, um, like in theory, everything should be sorted by coordinates. But in case they're not, you can specify how you want to sort uh, things. Um, and also you can specify the platform unit. These are just some um, like, like, lo like logistic things. And lastly, you specify your sample name. So here, I mean, this sample is already called this already, but in case they're not, if they're just like number one, then you can change your sample ID here. So this step should also be fairly fast. Um, so here I wrote this code that I called PyCard, I called add or change uh, read groups, input, output, um, whatever else. Okay, let's see if it runs. Seems it's running. Um, since this is a really just a annotation part, this step is pretty fast. Okay, let's leave it running and let's continue on our end. Um, so the next thing that we're going to deal with in GATK, uh, which is actually one of the last steps before we have this BOM file ready to go, is what we call base quality score recalibration. Uh, the acronym is BQSR. Uh, later, like after we have a VCF file, we're gonna deal with another function called VQSR. So they sound really alike, they read really alike, but they're not exactly the same thing. So, and they're all in GATK, which is confusing. Uh, so just make sure like you're calling the right thing here. Okay, so what, what is BQSR? Like wh wh why we need to do this? Uh, we have, for example, if we try to visualize our BOM, original BOM file in IGV, uh, we may see that things look really messy. Like it doesn't really look like, like how, how they're supposed to be. Like like there, there are some parts, like, like there, there may be some like, like this artifacts that it looks like a variant, but it may or may not actually be that. So that is because, I mean, this is the nature of the raw sequencing data. Um, it may have a lot of like this systematic or machine errors um, made like from the sequencing process. So you want to, before you call variants, because those systematic errors may look like variants, but they're not. So you want to make sure you get rid of those before you actually call the real variants. So this is essentially what this recalibration about. It's like, we want to identify what is a real 
variant, what is a artifacts, and we get rid of them. Um, so that's what this process is all about. And, and as GATK tells us, like the, especially for this short variance coding process, it re relies heavily on the, this quality scores. So essentially what we're trying to do is we want to train a machine learning model um, to figure out, um, like given the quality score and how variants look like in a set that we know for sure these are the truth, and we want to readjust like our sequencing data based on that. Um, so in case you guys are not familiar with machine learning model, it sounds really fancy. Everybody talks about machine learning these days. Um, just a quick like recap of what machine learning is about. Um, you can think of machine learning as a dummy that like, or if you try to think about yourself, like when you're really young, um, when you're learning about the world. Uh, so say people tell you there's a categorical fruit, there's another categorical vegetable. Uh, you don't really know what they are because at first those two categories just sounds really abstract for you. You look at some, like an object in front of you, you may not know if it's fruit or vegetable. So how do you figure those out? So when, when we are learning, like when we're really young, like we're given examples. So we're given that, like look at an apple, this is a fruit. Look at a pear, this is a fruit. A banana is a fruit. So you're given a lot of examples of what fruit is. And eventually in yourself, you kind of figure, okay, I kind of figure some common theme about what fruit is. And then you're told uh, a celery is a vegetable, a cabbage is a vegetable, um, tomato is a vegetable, onion is a vegetable. So then you also figure, okay, I kind of figure what vegetable is. There may not be, they may not be that clear what they are, but generally speaking, so now if you're given like some, like if you're given a carrot and people ask you if this is a fruit or vegetable, given what you have seen before, you figure, okay, this most likely is a vegetable. So that's how we learn things when, when we were learning. And for machine learning, this is a very similar process. It's at first, you have a dummy model that knows nothing. It's just a thing, like it's there. So you give it data that with labels that is like well labeled. So you give it like, this is a bad quality score. This is a good quality score. And this is what they're associated with. You get, you, if after it has seen enough examples, it kind of like made, like you kind of mold this model into a thing that it can, after you give it another thing without a label, it can give you a classification of if it's a vegetable, if it's a fruit. So that's like a analogy of what machine learning is about. It needs to see a lot of real data with good labels to figure out um, how to make a right decision between two classes. So back to BQSR, that was a long way of saying what BQSR is, is uh, in GATK, it can train a machine learning model. Uh, in which case you give it, uh, it requires a set of, um, existing data that um, from all other studies, these are the data that we trust, these are for sure variants, and they're all associated with quality scores and how these variants look like. Um, so this is our, our training data in this machine learning model. So for a human, um, again, the Broad Institute gave, conveniently gave us a lot of information other than the reference genome. So we can download some like the, the SNP database, and we can also download um, uh, Indel database. Um, so it, anyway, those all gave us like, like some existing sites of things that we, we know these are for sure variants, uh, they're good. So those are the input for the machine learning model. So back to our data. Okay, so first of all, that add or replace uh, regroup process finished. Uh, like, after you see this message, you know it's done. There's no error, we're good. And then if you look at the output, it now gave us another new BOM file. Like after this, this is a new BOM file that is marked. Uh, the duplicates are marked marked up and the real groups are well labeled. So this is the BOM file that we're gonna need for our BQSR process. So now, since we no longer need this, if it's taking a lot of disk space, you can get rid of that or keep it depending on what, what, what you prefer. So now if we go back to our folder, 
So now we're talking about BQSR. If you go to this folder, then the, uh, the non-sites, I downloaded all of the SNPs and indels that have been identified in a thousand genome project. Um, so for, I mean, since we're using a thousand genome data, we can use their profile for, for, this, for this step. Ideally, we want to, we want to use uh, SNP and indel uh, profile from all human populations. So there is such a thing, it's called DP SNPs. It's a, uh, uh, it's a database of all human short variants. Uh, I think current is hosted by NCBI. You can download it directly from their FTP, um, but that file is ridiculously big. Um, we don't necessarily need that here. So for our, like to, to make our practice like, a, like a something manageable within the next couple of days, um, I didn't download that part, but we, we can also use that if you prefer. So we can use this um, as our training data in this BQSR machine learning model. So how does this work? For also for other, most of the other uh, common study systems, you can download this uh, short variance, this uh, non sites uh, from some online platform. So for mouse, you can use uh, the Sanger uh, database. Um, I think for plants, there should be things like this similar too. I just don't know what exactly they are. Um, anyway, so going back to BQSR, now that we know this is uh, our non, like the training data, how do we set, how do we train a machine learning model, first of all? So again, here we come back to GATK. This is no longer in PyCard. In GATK, we call the BQSR uh, function, it's a base recalibrator. We tell it what is our reference genome. So we need to give it the path of our reference that FASTA file, like that, that thing. And the input is our new BOM file that we just generated after the two uh, 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 cleaning steps. And we need to specify the known sites. So um, here we have two set of known sites. We have the SNPs and we have the indels. They're two separate files. So you can, you can specify known sites twice. If you have one thing, you can just specify it once. So this part, like this known size can be multiple, like this long story of errors. And the output, instead of giving you a new bomb file uh, just yet, before that, it actually, so this step only give you a table. So what it is, is it, this step trains a machine learning model and it tells you which part of your bomb file needs to be recalibrated. So this table is a relatively small file. It's not that big. It's not even comparable to the BOM file size, but this process, just remember, it does not give you a new BOM file yet, but it gives you a list of things in this table that, um, that the recalibration needs to be done at. So uh, I gave you some sample command for this process. This process takes quite a while. Um, I don't know, I, I never finished this for our sample data. So I don't know how long exactly it takes to run this, but since it's, it, it's related to training and machine learning model, it's, it, it's gonna take a little bit, at least not something we're gonna wait here. So you try this here, uh, couldn't read file, okay. I think I'm in the wrong folder. Uh, now it should work. Okay, there. It is working. So you can watch this working or you can submit this as a job and wait somewhere else and you don't have to watch this happening live. But anyway, this is already showing you this training part is working. It is going to eventually generate, generate you a table, but we're not gonna wait it here. Um, do you guys wanna take another break? We're almost done for the preparing the, the, the bump file part. What if we take another short break? Now is 3.34, let's say 3.35. Uh, how about we take a short break? We come back here at 3.45 PM, like in 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, so, okay, let me finish this BQSR part because we have a little bit left. Um, and I think the rest we can just continue tomorrow since 
Yeah. I mean, most people left already. Okay, yeah. so so this part, and I think other people can catch up when when they when they went, when they watch the video. So when before we ended uh, for the break, uh, here is where we left off of. Like we say that we can train a model uh, under BQSR to figure out which things to recalibrate. And so we generated this table. Um, uh, so I can't really run the example here because I didn't finish running this because uh, this is gonna take a, a little bit of time. Uh, so anyway, so after we train the model, we have that table of which ones to recalibrate. Now we can actually run the recalibration and generate a new bump file. So what we do is we call GATK. Uh, we have uh, whatever Java option. And now instead of doing the base calibrator function, we actually apply the BQSR. So we call this function. We specify the reference genome, which is our reference FASTA file. We specify our input, which is our bump file from the previous step after we mark uh, the duplicates and after we run, uh, we, we add the read group. And now we tell it what is the input recalibration file, which is this table that we just generated from the last step. So we, we specify this, and now we say we're gonna generate an output, which is a BQSR calibrated new BOM file. So this, so uh, I forgot how long this step takes, um, but altogether these two steps um, may take anything between like, an hour to more than that, depending on how big our original BAM file is. I think since now we only have one chromosome, this shouldn't take that long. So what I want you guys to do is to, I gave you a sample commands here, uh, like ev with everything we have covered in this class up until here to apply the BQSR, uh, run this on a few individuals that you want to call variants from. So I have all these examples on this one individuals. So you can set, set up a job request that does several individuals in parallel. Um, so run those and eventually this bomb file that this after the mark uh, duplicates, after add group, after the BQSR recalibration, this bomb file is the one that we're going to need for calling the variants. So, does this sound good? If so, if there's no more question, I think we can safely end today's workshop. And tomorrow we're going to we're gonna to, going to assume everybody have this bomb file that we have cleaned up and this is ready to go. And we're gonna use that um, to um, to call the variants. So do I have any additional questions? Um, just a quick question. Can you, uh, I might have missed, like, uh, can you tell, like, how the model is kind of trained on the, like, the base recalibration? Yeah. Like, the VCF, like, yeah. how do they, like, on the thousand genomes? Yeah. So, so if you look at this non, wait, am I still sharing my screen? No. Um, okay. Are you seeing my terminal now? Yeah. Okay, so if we go to this non size and if you look at like what, what I downloaded here. So these are some VCF files in like compressed by, uh, term. So since VCF, it, they're, they're not binary, it's, those are real text files. You can literally ZLS and look at how they look like. So everything looks like a VCF. It starts with VCF headers and we just continue going, keep going. Um, so there, so, okay. So now we start the actual VCF part. So this looks like a VCF, except it doesn't have all the individuals. So it has all of this. So, so this is the Indel, Indel file. So it has all the, like everything, nothing is a snip. So they're all like small insertions or deletions. Um, so this is a profile of human Indels from the thousand genome data. So this is everything that after like these studies have worked on this, they trusted these are real variants. 
And each variance, like we know how things look like, and also we know what their quality score is. So I think what this machine learning is doing is it's trying to associate the pattern between the quality score um, and also the variance. So that maybe like when, when there's like a, like an indel, you shouldn't have a quality score being like zero or like, or, or, or something like really like, like off. So like it's going to look at all of this uh, uh, trusted indels and figure out how a real indel should look like. And also we can similarly look at this, uh, this SNP data. So SNP data is similarly like this is a, all the headers and now we come down all the SNPs. So everything is like, like there's one entry in the reference and there's one entry in the and alternate, these are all SNPs and they are all each associated with quality scores and all this other information it, it has. So uh, I, um, right now I can't really talk about like uh, how exactly uh, uh, this, uh, the underlying, uh, I, I don't know what type of algorithm they're using in this machine learning model, but in, in general, um, they look at this existing sites um, and like these are the things we trust and it's a, so like it's, it's trying to find patterns between what its variants look like and their quality scores. So, so this is uh, like after looking at all of the sites, this model is going to have like a, it should have a trained model where it should like, if you give it another site uh, with a quality score, it should tell you whether or not this is a, this is good or this is an artifact. Um, so if you're interested in an underlying algorithm for this thing, I think you can again, go back to the G GATK website. They should have a place where they talk about like what exactly is going on uh, in this machine learning model. Um, from like just off of my head right now, I can't really say like what type of algorithm it is. Um, I mean, I don't know which exactly is a machine learning model they used, but generally speaking, it's looking at some trusted data and it's going to classify your data. Yeah, yeah that's helpful. Yeah. Um, so with this, let's end today's thing here again for before tomorrow, it'll be really helpful if you can get a few of these cleaned bomb files so that we can use them as example to go for the variant calling. Uh, let's continue tomorrow. And thanks for so much for staying until now. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. See you tomorrow. Bye. See you. Bye.